So right. welcome to this uh, episode of the Order to Chaos series. I'm very, very pleased to have joining us a, a legend in the fire department and emergency services. So before I turn it over to him to do a very quick intro, we are going to be talking a lot about leadership in crisis, which again, people can apply directly to their corporate and professional lives. So Pete, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And why don't you just give just even a brief uh, intro for yourself. And obviously I've done one already, but what uh, what would you like people to, to know about your experience? Yeah. Um, so I'm failing at retirement for the second time now. I, uh, <laughs> I spent 33 years with the Chicago Fire Department. I, I left there in 2013 for purely personal reasons. Uh, I was pretty much maxed out on my you know promotional opportunities, pension, all that kind of stuff. And then I, I was strangely enough offered a job in a suburb of Chicago and I wound up being fire chief out there for five and a half years or so. And then last April, I retired from there. So um, now I'm you know, failing at retirement by uh, teaching a fair amount. Uh, the, the, I, I guess the, the relevant part of the background is I got involved with Underwriters Laboratories and their Firefighter Safety Research Institute as it was being formed back in 2006, 2007, thereabouts. And so I spend my time now uh, communicating that information to the fire service in one way or another. And so it would be safe to say after 30 plus years in the fire service, you're no uh, amateur when it comes to dealing with emergencies and crisis and leading people through some pretty interesting experiences, I could only assume. So those are some of the things that we're going to really unpack today from a leadership perspective. So Pete, does anything come to mind with regard to a particular story or experience that you've had that really crystallizes what it takes to lead in general, but also during crisis? It, well, I I'm going to, I'm going to try this one. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Cause I'm not a very good at telling fire stories. I just, okay. Until somebody else starts, I can't, I have a hard time coming up with, you know, recalling it myself. But so I have this, this recollection and I, I like to say when I'm presenting in a class, I say every, you know, you've heard about the book, everything I uh, need to know I learned in kindergarten, right? Well, everything I needed to know about the fire service, I learned from my first officer, Tommy Barrett. Um, and it's true in a lot of ways. I mean, Tommy was just one of those natural leader kind of guys very quiet, very unassuming, very soft-spoken, but lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson, a lot of which didn't really dawn on me until years later, right? It's kind of like how your dad gets smart after you're 21. Tommy got, Tommy got really smart once I became a lieutenant myself, right? But the one that sticks in my mind the most, I couldn't have had more than eight, it was certainly less than a year in a job, somewhere around eight months. And I was blessed that Tommy never said, do this because I said so. Tommy always wanted to know, why did I do what I did, right? So what, we, we had this incident, Tommy, you know, it, just a routine. Well, I, and, but I could tell this one was a little different. He was kind of on edge. And he said, well, why did you do that? And I said, well, let's call him John. I said, John told me to do it. And he says, well, why would you do what John said? I said, John's got 20 years on the job. And he pulls me aside a little more because we're still on the scene. And he says, listen, Pete. There are guys with 20 years on the job and there are guys with one year repeated 20 times and John falls into the second category. Right? And huge, huge lesson, right? Is that time on the job doesn't equal experience and an experience doesn't equal knowledge and understanding. Right. And, and that those two things, right. Are, are important. Right. And that you always have to be you know, questioning. And, and we, we live in this, not in the fire service. I mean, it's, it's a authority driven job and it, and it needs to be, but even with that, you need to be responsible for your own decisions, no matter where you are in the pecking order. Um, and that was just a huge, huge lesson that I find myself having to relearn again and again and again throughout my career. So when you have people like quote unquote John, so the same year repeated 20 times, what's the difference between a, a John and say a, a Tom for that matter? If you were to look at those two, because I think that we, we have that in all of our lives where we've got somebody where they've got so many years and they just get an automatic pass in a lot of cases is, wow, they've got a lot of years in, but to your point, that's a really good point where years of experience, it's uh, it's completely different. So what is the difference between a, a John and a Tom in, in your experience? Tom knows that he can never know enough. Tom in, in a very intuitive way. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cl cliche in the fire service. You never stop learning on this job. You hear people say that all the time. And usually what they mean is you never stop learning from me, right? 
but Tom understood that, that you just can't know enough, that you're always ignorant. And that, you know, because so many things touch our job, right? So many things are unknowable that it's, it's just not possible, right? So, so if, you're, if, you're, if you stay very, very conscious of the fact that you don't know enough and you need to be absorbing information all the time, then you really are always learning. But, but once you get comfortable, once you get, you know, that feeling that I know what I'm doing and I can handle this and, and I got it down, then you're, you're either becoming dangerous or irrelevant in some cases, right? I mean, you might do your one little narrow aspect of the job really well, but uh, the fire service needs generalists, not specialists. And so you don't, you don't serve your community very well when you become that specialist or your fire department or your fellow fire department. Yeah, and I think that we're seeing that in the private sector as well, where the breadth of problems and issues and challenges are so great that to your point, the second that you think I've got this one dialed in, that's exactly when you're going to get a left field oh, yeah. uh, during a meeting or something. So what are, what are people looking for from, from your perspective in their leader? So I heard you talk about, you know, lifelong learner, but it's also maybe being humble would be one of those things. What else are people looking for? in their leader I, during, during all times? I think the, the two words always come back to me whenever we're having these discussions. And, and one is trust. Uh, as simple and it, uh, you know, that, as that can sound is that people follow those people that they can trust. And however you wanna define that or shape that, you know, can, can vary a lot during different circumstances and environments, but fundamentally, right? Do, will I trust this person to take care of me? Uh, they're not gonna follow you if they don't trust you. you know? And the second word that comes back again and again is honor. And there's a lot of ways to talk about integrity and truth and honesty and all those sorts of things. But when you think about it, honor encapsulates them all, right? Can, can you look at yourself and say, am I doing the honorable thing? And if you can't, then your ability to lead groups are, you know, because they're, they're whether they can articulate it or not, they're, they're going to respond to that. Is this an honorable person? Is this somebody who I can, and, and that honor ties into trust, right? Um, you can't have one without the other. They feed on each other. They, they, they so that's a really good point because, you know, trust is ultimately where we're trying to get to. Um, so in your experience, how would you establish trust with the people that you work with, for example? Like, is it a one grandiose declaration or is it more an accumulation of, of things? Yeah. yeah, you know, some people are really good at that. You know, they're, they're those, uh, what, what would you call it? The, the, the leaders that personify leadership. The, the, they're overtly good leaders. And, and I think they can get away with that sort of bombastic sort of follow me, lead from the front, that sort of thing. And if, you're, if you had that personality, God bless you, right? But that's not, that's not most of us. Most of us, you know, fail every single day. Right. And when we're when we're talking to new lieutenants and new officers and we talk about these leadership things, you've got to accept that you're going to fail every single day. And then the, the key is to come back and and try again. Right. So the, that person who is clearly making the effort to take care of their subordinates every single day and not just going through the motions, but clearly means it when when someone says and Brunin Sini, who, you know, um, was just a genius at this kind of stuff, right? So if you were to ask somebody, how are you feeling? What do they say? They say, fine. And Alan would say, the follow-up question is, tell me about fine. Mm. So, and now, now you've established that you really do care, right? It's not just this normative sort of exchange we go through in, in social discourse. It's, oh, tell me about fine. Um, now you really do care, right? Now I know, I really, I want to hear, how, how are you doing? Tell me about that. Right. Um, yeah. And it, and it was those sorts of things that, that Tommy was really good at, right? It, that he really did care, you know, that, that you understood what you were doing and why. It wasn't just one for emotion. So. And would it be safe to say that, well, first of all, your team members need to know. So what I'm hearing you say is they need to know that you care first and foremost. And that's a genuine care, not just a perfunctuary. Uh, hey, that's cool. How was your night? Oh, it was good, sir. Yeah, that's great. Uh, let's move on and start doing stuff. So, so you talked about the follow-up question of, you know, tell me about fine. And I think that we're seeing a lot of this in this current environment and during crisis where we, as leaders, we're so busy doing 5 million other things, but really it only takes an extra 30 seconds with each person to ask them, tell me about fine. And is there anything else that, that builds trust in teams? Because I, I agree hundred percent. Trust is basic. If you don't have that, you don't have a team. But is there anything else 
in your experience, Pete, that can really build trust? I think something that, that even in our lifetimes has changed is that it's the, the personal contact. And, and I mean the physical, personal contact. Right? We do so much by email and, and text and all, which is wonderful. It's, a, it's effective in a lot of different ways. It accomplishes a lot of things. But there's always that because of the brevity of those messages, there's way too much room for misinformation or for incomplete thoughts. And so you can solve so many problems and build so many relationships when you get out of your chair and actually go talk to the person that you've got an issue. And I mean, you know, where you can look at each other, not just over the phone. I mean, that, that'll do if you have to. But um, every form of communication is better than email is the way I like to say, or, or tech, you know, electronic, right? It, it has its place and it's extraordinarily useful in its way. Um, but when it gets in the way of personal relationships, uh, which in, inevitably does, uh, then you have that break. You can't build trust. You can't build confidence. You can't have that stuff if they can't see you and hear you and respond immediately to each other, all that stuff that only personal contact allows you to do. And would you agree that there's something almost like energetic with regard to being in the presence of another person that you can actually sense whether they're being genuine and whether you can trust them even without being overt about it because I, I don't think any of us walk into a room and say I wonder if I could trust this person would it be safe to say that that's something that you can almost feel or not feel through those it, through those interactions in, in the body language sort of stuff like you know you're seeing me from the shoulders up right there's all kinds of fidgeting or whatever going on down here um that that you don't see even when you're doing you know face to face over a, a video you know do, doing it online and all that um and so the body language is is a big part of it but there's also just those those little gestures the handshake the touch the all those sorts of things that that we use subconsciously to decide is this a genuine person or not, right? And you lose that when you don't have the personal contact. So you've got, you've got to find a way to incorporate that into your uh, interaction with your employees, especially your subordinates. Yeah. And, and again, that just goes to show that you care and actually be present and care when you're talking to them. And what about, let's, flip it now to honor because that means different things to different people and it's yeah. kind of a almost a throwback to the old days where we lived with honor what when you said that what exactly do you mean it's not it's not a term you hear used very much but when when you think about it to, to me it, it encapsulate, encapsulates all those other um, similar terms. Like, you know, you, know you, you have to be honest. You have to be forthright, right? You have to be trustworthy, you, all these things. Well, if, you had a, if I had to find one word for all those things, it, it would be honor, right? So it, it's, it's fundamentally, you know, it, it's two things. One, can I look myself in the mirror and live with this decision or, or what I said? And the second part of it, as silly as it may sound, is could I look my mother in the eye and say what I just said and get away with it, right? And, mm -hmm. and I mean, even the United States Marine Corps uses that example in terms of, uh, you know, hazing things and, and stuff like that. I said, would you do this in front of your mother? If not, it's inappropriate, right? And, uh, I, and I, I find that so true in so many of our professional relationships, right? If my mom was sitting here, would I be treating this person the way I'm treating them right now? And, if and a lot of times the answer yeah. is no. Yeah, or, or I'm not sure, or yeah, but, right? right? As soon as you say, yeah, but, well, you know what? You're wrong, right? You're wrong because yeah, yeah. that's what our parents, and we often say our mother, but our, our parents held us to those kind of standards, right? So would it be safe to say then, because an area we don't talk a lot about are values. And in my experience, you're looking for leaders that really align with your values. And would values fall into honor as well? It's absolutely. And, and this is where I think our discussions about leadership often break down because we're reticent to talk about things like values because we confuse them with morals and, and things mm -hmm. like that. It's really, no, this is, if you can't um, and again, and I got to be careful about this because I, I was never in the, the military at all. But I, you know, and I refer to these Marine Corps lessons a lot because a lot of my peers and a lot of my mentors were uh, in the service in the Marine Corps in particular. And, and so I've drawn a lot of lessons from those sorts of things. You know, they, they like to say that we put the cult in culture. You know, it, they're not afraid to express who and what they are. 
you know, and, and you can agree or disagree or whatever, but this is who we are, right? And, and if a, as a company, as a fire service, as a fire department, or as in, in this case, as a private company, if, if you can't articulate your company's values, um, you're, you're in serious trouble. You, you really are. And, and, and there, has, there has to be a means of doing that, right? And, and if you're trying to lead and motivate and do these other things, and you haven't clearly articulated what those values are, you're going to find yourself not getting very far. You're going to be very frustrated. And, and I think, and I don't want to speak for you, but in, in my own experience, so many conflicts come down to conflicting values. And often we don't use values as a means to bring people together, right? Like there's more that connects us than disconnects us. And sure. if a team has different val or team members have different values, that's often where you're going to see some conflict. That, any thoughts on that? We've gone through this in the fire service during the course of my career where we became a slightly less white male dominated organization, right? We've had to introduce di different, you know, different cultures, different races, uh, different genders, the, the whole thing. And it's, it's been a very real part of the fire service during the last 30 years or so. Um, and we often find ourselves talking about, you know, respecting our differences, respecting our differences differences, respecting our differences. Okay, that's all fine and good, but what's really going to bring us together is when we understand where our commonalities lie. And, and that's where, you know, because we, we get so caught up in where well, your values might be different than mine. Well, you're not going to find any teamwork or any, you know, getting together around that. Work on what, what, what do we all share as human beings? What's common amongst all ourselves, right? And, and those things are, first off, much easier to identify and then much easier to rally around. And, and finally, it's all you got is your innate commonalities, right? And if you're not focused on those things, you're, you're ultimately, it doesn't mean you don't respect those other things, but the, the focus has to become, the unity comes when you're focused on, on your commonalities. And what, what do we all share? And that takes you back to the discussion about the a corporation's or a group's values, right? You have to build those values and articulate those values around what everybody understands to be good and right and true. And, and we're going to revisit that when we talk about decision making here shortly, but I want to switch gears a little bit. And so Pete, 33 years ago, or let's say you were, when you first became an officer, maybe you got a stripe or something like that. What was, what was Pete back then thinking as a new leader relative to what Pete has is thinking now, yeah. thirty some years later, so, and I, I get we only have a certain amount of time. <laughs> so, so when when Pete got his first in, in in the United States, most of the fire service we we uh, get bugles, right, uh, trumpets, mm -hmm. and uh, so I got my first bugle and uh, or first stripe, and um, so I'm thinking, how am I going to get these guys that are twice my age to listen to what I have to say to them? Because I was, uh, I was maybe 27 years old when I became a lieutenant, which at the time was very young in, in a department of my size. Uh, so, so that was the big challenge. You know, how do, how do I get these guys respect? And, and you're always, 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 always hyper aware of that whole thing, right? And, and then what you find is that you typically try to get their respect by doing what they want to do, like letting them have their way, right? And that's that's a big mistake, right? So mm -hmm. you you learn those hard lessons about um, because yeah, and, and so and so the the guy thirty some years later um, wants to say with with um, to, to all those new lieutenants is you know don't make my mistakes. We we all go through that, but the, I think the big lesson for me and the big difference was is that you hit you have to show respect to get respect. Mm -hmm. And that's a very easy thing to articulate, but it can be an extraordinarily difficult thing to accomplish because you don't know necessarily what that individual, uh, how they feel respected. You have to learn what makes them feel respected. And, and it's hard work. This was one of the very, very late lessons I learned about leadership is that it's hard work. And that's why good leaders are so rare is because they're not willing to put in the effort. It really is like, like any other skill that requires an extraordinarily amount, uh, an extraordinary amount of effort to get good at it. And if you're looking for some magic sort of formula or, you know, motivational speech or whatnot, it's about grinding effort. It's hard. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Trial and error and being deliberate, fine tuning. If that doesn't work, try this kind of thing. Would you another agree? Another thing that, that I, I learned really late was it doesn't get easier. 
don't expect it to get easier, expect it to get harder. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I work out every day and I, I, I at a gym and there's a, the, the trainer that's there. He, uh, he, he's got a t-shirt he often wears says burpees hate you too. You know, because <laughs> everybody hates doing burpees, right? And because they don't get any easier, at least not for me, right? And, and it's become one of my metaphors for leadership. Leadership is burpees. It, it's hard. It's going to stay hard. It's never going to get easier. Get, suck it up. Get used to it, right? Um, and, and the more comfortable you get with that idea, ultimately, the easier it does become because you realize it's going to be a challenge every day, right? And so when you're a new leader, you talked about the respect. And I think that a lot of young leaders, to your point, they know that they want to get respect, but then they end up giving away their power, which ironically takes away their respect influence. Would What are your thoughts on that? Would you agree? Um, especially in a organization that's built around leadership, right? That's a hierarchical organization. Um, people expect to be led, right? So, so, a, a, a senior member, a senior employee that that um, that wants to be respected doesn't want to be, you know, doesn't want you to say, "Well, do what you want to do." You're the senior guy; you must know. No, they they expect to be led. They want to be led competently, right? Um, but the, it's it's about learning what what makes that individual unique. What what do they excel at, and does does do they know that you know that they excel at that? And doing this in a way that isn't, you know, you're not, you're not pandering to them, right? You're, you're a genuine desire to learn. I want to know what you know, and, and a genuinely expressing that desire. For me, just once I figured that out, uh, made my life so much easier, right? Is that everybody is contributing in, in, in some way, shape, or form. How does this guy contribute? How do they figure into the organization? And, and a genuine appreciation for what they do. And that takes work on your part because you really have to learn, right? You can't, it's not just about the words. Oh, I really appreciate your contribution to the organization. That, that don't cut it. It's show me how you do that. Explain to me, you know, that what you do doesn't make sense to me, but I know that you're an expert at it. So help me understand what it is you understand, right? And, and making that extra effort. So young Pete, then he was trying to figure out how to get respect. And, and what I heard you say is probably gave away a lot of your power. What other, you know, looking back, did young Pete do that, that maybe uh, you would, you would have done differently. And again, we're all doing the best we can with what we have. Like, for example, for me, as a young leader it was always about me, right? So now I, I thought, oh, good. I'm in charge and the team supports me. So yeah. I'm in charge. You guys work for me. But to your point, as I've gotten slightly older, I've completely reversed that around. But yeah. what are your thoughts? So, what else did young Pete have to learn? So young, young Pete was trying too hard to be in charge and not trying hard enough to be responsible, right? Mm -hmm. And being a leader is about being responsible. You know, you're not, not in charge of things. You're, you're responsible for things. And, and so when you can make that mental shift, that, that helps. And people see the difference, right? I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm responsible for what happens here. So therefore, right? And then the other part is uh, that young Pete wished he was better at was setting expectations. Clear expectations are the most important thing for any subordinate to understand, right? And, and we're, all of us are really bad. And that's one of those burpy kind of thing. It's always hard. It's, you know, it, what are the expectations and effectively communicating those expectations to your subordinates is, is just, or team members, it doesn't necessarily have to be subordinates, uh, is just critically, critically important. They, they have to understand what the expectations are. Um, and then the other one that I didn't do well enough because it was always, not every, and every organization culture is a little different, even within the fire service, but um, and I'm a trainer now. That's that's how I would define myself. But training every day and make, having good high fidelity training every day as that young guy telling these old guys, you know, we're gonna we're gonna train on this, we're gonna have to work on this. I found that very difficult to do. Uh, but it's one of the things I emphatically tell young officers they have to do from day one: train your unit, train your company. Every part of every day needs to be about how do we get ourselves better. Right. So even in a corporate environment, right, how, how are we going to be better today than we were yesterday? Uh, mm -hmm. And some part of your day has to be devoted to that. And it's the leader's responsibility to, to see that that happens. Yeah. And, and I think that we, you know, in emergency services, that's I'm not going to say that's kind of ingrained, but it's expected 
to do at what we call after action reviews and things like that. But yep. certainly, you know, it doesn't have to be anything big and formal, but it could be having a meeting at the end of the day and saying, Hey, you know what, today we had some challenges in this project or whatever that looked like. Um, sure. I think it is, is easy. And in fact, I have a little poster in the back here that says 1% improvement every day. And then by the end of the year, like that's an exponential improvement. Absolutely. And, and that, like to that your point, it's gotta be part of your culture. Yeah, I like the hot wash concept. You know, I don't know if, if you guys, yeah, you use those terms. It's, it's not even the after action yet, right? It's just immediately when the task is done. How'd that go? You know, what did, what did you do? I, I wasn't watching what you were doing over there. What'd you do? And everybody just sort of recounts, okay, this is, this is what we did. This is how the day went or the operation went. And no explaining, no, you know, but a lot of times spontaneously out of that was, yeah, we did this, but next time we, you know, and, and when, when the, when the team self identifies those things, then you're 95% of the way there, right? Now your after actions, your critiques, your rewriting stuff, you're, you know, trying to improve. It becomes simple because everybody's self identified, you know, here, here's where we felt like we could have made an improvement. Now, does that also mean that the team needs to know what their mission is Oh, uh, and, and have that very clearly articulated. That's the expectations part of it, right? And uh, one of those, you know, came late lessons for me, but that I'm a, an absolute zealot about now is that th the way the firehouse goes, the way the, fire, the, the way the routine goes is the way the emergency is going to go. And if you think that when the alarm sounds, you're going to get your act together and come together as a group, I got news for you. And, and there's a lot of there's a lot of fire service groups that, that think, oh, yeah, we do that. And it's, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> You've convinced yourself that you do, but it ain't happening, right? It, it's the mastering the details of those routine things. And this is a lesson from the military. This is why they do things the way they do. Those details matter. And that cohesiveness around the routine and that paying attention to detail about the, and caring about the routine and how you perform those routines and why that's important to each other. That's what makes the, the, the difficult part of the job come together then, right? The emergency scene or however it is. Yeah, and, and I think too, in, in my experience, it, the saying is, I think, something to the effect of um, how you do the small things is how you do everything. So yeah. if you're blowing off the small things, then to expect, particularly during crisis, for people to rise up and, and sure. reach this heroic stage is probably... Sure. Absolutely. Not going to happen. Absolutely. And, and you, you know, we do rig checks every day, even though nobody opened that compartment yesterday. So nothing's moved, but we're still going to open the compartment and we're, we're going to check it. And we do, you know, we wash things every day. We clean things every day. And it's not about making them clean, really, because they're, you know, they just got washed yesterday. Uh, it's about paying attention to the detail. Right? It's about minding, minding the detail, minding the things um, that because those little mistakes, those unnoticeable things are the ones that accumulate. You know? And it's also where you, you start to find respect for one another. You know, we, you were talking about this respect thing. And I think sometimes we look for it in the in the job performance itself. And I just had this recollection. I, I had a guy when I was captain of Engine 23, I had a guy who was not exactly well liked by the group and it was just his personality he was a little abrasive um but in the in the chicago fire department particularly at that time they would give you all the floor wax you wanted to wax the floors right but after 40 years of wax accumulation no matter what you did to the floor it looked like crap right well this guy his side job was floor maintenance he was he had it was a you know he did floors, right? And so he had all the equipment and the tools and whatever. And the, the short story is I let him come in, strip our floors, put high quality wax on that the crap the city gave us. And our, our floors in our fire station look like a hospital's floors, quite literally. And so when the chiefs came in to do their, you know, routine inspections and they saw this transformation, it was like, you know, we could have had junk piled up anywhere the floors just became oh my god this you guys got your act together look how beautiful this place is and in the course of all that this fella earned some respect right with the company because his contribution now became the thing that everybody knew about right and so he started to have the respect and i started respect him in a way i didn't respect him before because he wasn't much of a firefighter he was kind of a pain in the ass to be around um, but he, he had something to contribute that really made a difference to how our company, our group was perceived by the larger organization, right? Uh, so he became somebody, you know, 